My name is Lucas Redbear, and this happened to me in 1993. I had just turned 32, a proud member of the Cherokee Nation, living in the outskirts of Cook City, Montana. My family had moved here when I was young, seeking the solitude of the mountains and the promise of a simple life. I worked as a park ranger, a job I enjoyed, connecting me to nature and my roots. This place had always felt like home, until one summer evening changed everything. The day started like any other. I woke up early, had my usual coffee, and headed out for my shift. The park was bustling with tourists, families enjoying the trails and the beauty of the place. I exchanged pleasantries with regulars and gave directions to newcomers. The sun was setting when I received a call about a lost hiker. It was nothing out of the ordinary, and I was used to such calls. I grabbed my gear and headed towards the reported area, a less traveled part of the park. The sky turned orange and purple, casting long shadows through the dense forest. As I made my way up the trail, I thought about the many times I had walked these paths with my father, who had taught me everything about the wilderness. About an hour into my search, I found the hiker, a man named Greg Mallory. He was disoriented but unharmed. We chatted as we made our way back, and he told me how he had ventured off the path to take photos and got lost. It was getting dark, and the air grew colder. We picked up the pace, eager to get back before nightfall. Suddenly, we heard a scream. It echoed through the trees, stopping us in our tracks. I looked at Greg, and he was pale. Did you hear that? He asked, his voice trembling. Yeah. I replied, trying to keep calm. Stay close. We moved cautiously towards the sound, my flashlight cutting through the growing darkness. The scream had come from a small clearing up ahead. When we got there, what we found was beyond anything I had ever seen. A campsite, torn apart. Blood stained the ground, and there were signs of a struggle. Two tents lay shredded, sleeping bags tossed around. I knelt down to examine the scene and that's when I saw the body. A man, his face unrecognizable, his clothes ripped to shreds. Greg gagged and turned away. What the hell happened here? He whispered. I don't know, I said, my mind racing. But we need to call for help. I reached for my radio, but all I got was static. No signal. Damn it, I muttered. We need to get back to the main trail. As we started to leave, I saw something move at the edge of the clearing. It was quick a blur in the dim light. I couldn't make out what it was, but it was big. My heart pounded in my chest. Did you see that? Greg asked, his eyes wide with fear. Yeah, let's keep moving. We hurried back, every sound in the forest amplified in the silence of the night. Branches snapped and leaves rustled. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling like we were being watched. Greg was struggling to keep up, his breathing heavy. Come on, Greg. We're almost there, I urged. Then, without warning, something crashed through the trees behind us. We spun around, and that's when I saw it. A creature, tall and gaunt, with long limbs and glowing eyes. It stood there, staring at us, its breath visible in the cold night air. Run! I shouted, grabbing Greg's arm. We ran like our lives depended on it, and they did. The creature followed, its movements eerily silent. We stumbled over roots and rocks, the flashlight flickering. My mind raced, trying to figure out what the hell we were dealing with. It wasn't an animal, at least not any I knew. We burst onto the main trail and I saw the lights of the ranger station ahead. There! Go! I yelled. We made it inside, slamming the door shut behind us. I locked it and grabbed the rifle from the wall. Greg collapsed onto a chair, gasping for breath. What was that? He panted. I don't know, I replied, checking the rifle. But it's not getting in here. We waited, the silence of the station broken only by our ragged breathing. I peered out the window, but there was no sign of the creature. Hours passed and dawn finally broke. The first rays of sunlight brought a sense of relief. We need to report this, I said, grabbing the radio. This time the signal was clear and I called for backup. 
When the other rangers arrived, we told them everything. They searched the area, but found nothing except the destroyed campsite and the body. The official report labeled it as a bear attack, but I knew better. Whatever we had seen, it wasn't a bear. Greg left the park that day and never came back. I stayed, determined to find out what was lurking in the woods. I started researching local legends and folklore, trying to find any clue. That's when I came across stories of the Skinwalker, a shape-shifting creature from Native American mythology. Could it be what we saw? I didn't know for sure, but it fit the description. Months passed, and there were no more incidents. But I never let my guard down. I patrolled the park, always alert, always watching. The memory of that night stayed with me, a reminder of the things that lurk in the shadows of the world. One evening, as I was closing up the station, an old man approached me. He introduced himself as Samuel Greywolf, an elder from a nearby reservation. He had heard about the attack and wanted to talk. I believe you saw something that night, he said, his voice calm and steady. I did, I replied, but I don't know what it was. He nodded. The elders speak of a creature that takes on the form of a man but is not human. A skinwalker. It's a guardian of the land, protecting it from those who mean harm. Why would it attack those campers? I asked. Sometimes it's a warning. Other times it's protecting something sacred. We may never know its true motives. His words stayed with me. Was the creature protecting something? Was it a guardian, as Samuel suggested? I didn't have answers, but I knew one thing for sure. The forest was its home, and it wanted to keep it that way. Life returned to normal, as normal as it could be after that night. I continued my work, always with a sense of vigilance. The park remained a place of beauty and danger, a reminder of the thin line between the known and the unknown. Years later, I still think about that night. The fear, the adrenaline, the unexplainable creature. I never saw it again, but its presence lingers, a part of the forest's dark secrets. I learned to respect the land even more, knowing that some things are beyond our understanding. I told my story to a few close friends, and they all had different reactions. Some believed me, others thought I was crazy. But I know what I saw, and it changed me. It made me more aware, more connected to my heritage and the ancient tales of my people. Now, as I sit here by the fire telling you this story, I hope you understand the importance of respect for the unknown. The world is full of mysteries, and sometimes it's better to let them be. We are not always meant to understand everything, but we can learn to coexist with the unknown. So, if you ever find yourself in the woods, remember this. Stay on the path, respect the land, and always be aware of what might be watching. The forest has its guardians, and they are not always friendly. My name is Tahoma Red Elk, and this happened to me in 2017. I was born and raised on the Yakima Reservation in Washington State. Life there is simple and straightforward, but it carries its own weight of history and mystery. I've always been the kind of person who prefers the company of trees and rivers over people. When I wasn't working construction, I'd be out fishing or hiking, feeling the pulse of the land beneath my feet. One summer, my buddy Clint Silverhawk and I decided to go on a camping trip to the Wenatchee National Forest. Clint and I grew up together, and our bond was forged through countless fishing trips and nights under the stars. We packed light, just the essentials, a couple of sleeping bags, some fishing gear, a tent, and enough food and beer to last us a few days. It was supposed to be a few days of unwinding, away from the noise of the world. The first day was perfect. We set up camp by a clear, fast-running creek. The sound of the water was like music, and the air was fresh with the scent of pine. We spent the day fishing, catching enough trout for a hearty dinner. As night fell, we built a fire, cooked our catch, and sat around, talking about everything and nothing. 
Clint was full of jokes and stories, making me laugh until my sides hurt. It was the kind of evening that reminded me why we did this, why we always came back to the wilderness. The next day, we decided to explore deeper into the forest. We found an old trail, barely visible under the overgrowth, and followed it. It led us to a secluded part of the forest, where the trees were thicker and the light struggled to penetrate. It felt like stepping into another world, one untouched by time. As we pushed through the dense foliage, we stumbled upon an old abandoned cabin. It looked like it had been there for decades, maybe even a century. The wood was weathered and gray, and the roof was partially caved in. Clint, always the curious one, suggested we take a look inside. I was hesitant, but his enthusiasm was infectious. Inside, the cabin was dark and musty. Dust motes floated in the beams of sunlight that managed to sneak through the cracks. There were old, broken pieces of furniture scattered around, and what looked like animal bones in the corner. Clint poked around while I stood by the door, feeling uneasy. Check this out, Clint called, holding up a rusted old hunting knife. Think this belonged to a pioneer or something? Maybe, I said, my eyes scanning the room. There was something about the place that didn't sit right with me. Let's get out of here. This place gives me the creeps. Clint laughed. You're such a wuss, Tahoma. We left the cabin and continued our hike, but the eerie feeling stayed with me. As the day wore on, the forest seemed to grow quieter, almost as if it was holding its breath. By the time we returned to our campsite, the sun was setting casting long shadows through the trees. That night, as we sat by the fire, the usual comfort of the crackling flames and the night sounds of the forest felt different. There was a tension in the air, a sense of being watched. Clint must have felt it too because he was quieter than usual. We turned in early, hoping a good night's sleep would shake off the unease. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to the sound of rustling outside the tent. I figured it was just an animal, maybe a deer or a raccoon. But the sound grew louder, more deliberate. Clint, I whispered, shaking him awake. You hear that? He groaned, half asleep. It's probably nothing, man. Go back to sleep. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent. The beam of light cut through the darkness revealing nothing but trees and shadows. I stepped out, my heart pounding in my chest. There was nothing there. I was about to head back inside when I saw it. A figure, standing at the edge of the clearing. It was tall and thin, almost skeletal, with skin that looked stretched and pale in the moonlight. I froze, my mind struggling to process what I was seeing. Clint! I hissed, louder this time. Get out here. He stumbled out of the tent, rubbing his eyes. What is it, Tahoma? I pointed, but the figure was gone. There was someone. Something out there. Clint looked around, frowning. You're seeing things. Probably just a trick of the light. But I knew what I saw. We stayed up the rest of the night, our fire burning bright, our ears straining for any sound. Morning came slowly, and with it, a sense of relief. But I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. We decided to pack up and head back. The forest, which had felt like a haven, now felt like a trap. We moved quickly, barely speaking, our eyes scanning the trees. As we neared the trailhead, we heard a scream, high-pitched and filled with terror. It was coming from deeper in the forest. Without thinking, we ran towards the sound. It was a woman, her clothes torn and bloodied, stumbling through the underbrush. She collapsed when she saw us, sobbing and gasping for breath. Help me, she cried. It's out there. It's killed them all. Clint knelt beside her, trying to calm her down. Who? What happened? She looked up at us with wide, terrified eyes. The Wendigo. I felt a chill run down my spine. The Wendigo was a creature from our folklore a malevolent spirit that preyed on humans, especially those who resorted to cannibalism. 
It was said to be an embodiment of hunger and greed, a creature that could never be satisfied. But that was just a story. This, this was real. We managed to get her to her feet and started back towards the trailhead. But we weren't fast enough. The forest around us seemed to close in, the shadows growing darker and more oppressive. We heard it before we saw it. A rustling in the trees, a low, inhuman moan. Then it was upon us, the creature from the night before. But now I could see it clearly. It was tall, impossibly so, with long limbs and fingers that ended in claws. Its eyes were hollow, and its mouth was a gaping maw filled with sharp, broken teeth. Clint pushed the woman behind us, drawing his hunting knife. Run! he yelled. Get to the trailhead and don't look back! I grabbed her hand and we ran. I heard Clint behind us shouting, and then a scream, a sound that will haunt me for the rest of my life. But I didn't stop. We burst out of the forest and onto the dirt road where our car was parked. I threw her into the passenger seat and jumped behind the wheel, my hands shaking as I fumbled with the keys. We drove like maniacs back to town, the woman sobbing quietly beside me. When we reached the nearest ranger station, I stumbled out shouting for help. The rangers took us inside, and I tried to explain what had happened. They looked at me like I was crazy, but they sent out a search party. They found Clint's body the next day, or what was left of it. The rangers said it was a bear attack, but I knew better. I saw the look in their eyes. They knew something was out there, something they didn't want to acknowledge. The woman, whose name was Mariah, told her story to the authorities. She and her friends had been camping in the same area when the creature attacked. She was the only survivor. After that, I couldn't go back to the forest. The place that had once been my refuge was now a reminder of the horror we experienced. I still dream about that night, about the creature and Clint's screams. Sometimes I think about going back, about finding whatever it was that took my friend. But then I remember the look in its eyes, the sheer hunger, and I know that some things are better left alone. Life goes on, but I'm not the same. I still fish, still hike, but I stick to open spaces, places where I can see for miles. The forest is no longer a place of peace for me. It's a place of nightmares, a place where the Wendigo still roams, waiting for its next victim. And I know, deep down, that it's still out there, watching waiting. My name is Nez Perel and this happened to me in 1994. I was living in Chinle, Arizona, working as a park ranger in Canyon de Chelly. My job was pretty straightforward. Patrol the canyon, guide the occasional tour, and make sure people didn't deface the ancient cliff dwellings. It was a good gig and I loved being out there among the red rocks and the wide open sky. My partner at the time was Marisol Valencia. She was sharp, tough, and didn't take crap from anyone. We got along well, mostly because we both enjoyed the quiet solitude of the canyon. One day, we got a call about some hikers who hadn't returned from their trek the previous night. Standard procedure was to wait 24 hours before sounding the alarm, but something about this felt off. The hikers were experienced. Two brothers, Lucas and Danny Monroe, who knew the area well. They wouldn't just disappear. We geared up and headed out to Spider Rock, a popular but treacherous spot. It's a tall, thin spire that stands out against the landscape like a sentinel. People say it's haunted, but locals have a lot of stories like that. We didn't give it much thought until we found their campsite. The tents were there, food was untouched, but there was no sign of the brothers. Marisol and I split up to cover more ground. I took the north side, moving along the base of the cliff. As I walked, I noticed something strange, carvings on the rock. They weren't like the ancient petroglyphs we were used to seeing. These were fresh, jagged, and they didn't make any sense. They looked almost like symbols. I radioed Marisol, but all I got was static. I kept moving, figuring she was out of range. About an hour in, I heard it. A scream. 
Not the kind you'd hear from someone who slipped or twisted an ankle. This was different. It was raw, primal. I started running toward the sound, heart pounding. I found Marisol standing near a narrow crevice. She was pale, eyes wide. In there, she said, pointing. I squeezed through the gap and found myself in a small, dark chamber. And there they were, the Monroe brothers, or what was left of them. They were lying in a heap, eyes open, mouths twisted in silent screams. There were those same symbols carved into the rock around them, and something else, blood. It was everywhere. Marisol managed to get a signal and called it in. While we waited for backup, we tried to make sense of it. This isn't right, she kept saying. This isn't normal. The police arrived, took one look, and called in the FBI. The whole area was cordoned off, and we were told to stay away. But Marisol and I couldn't let it go. We started digging, talking to locals, old-timers who knew the canyon's secrets. They told us about an old legend, something they called the Tall Man. According to the stories, the Tall Man was a spirit, a guardian of sorts who protected the canyon. But if you disrespected the land, he'd come for you. The more we learned, the more it seemed like the symbols were some kind of warning or summoning. But who would do that? And why? One night, a few weeks after the incident, Marisol and I were at a local bar, talking over a couple of beers. We were still obsessing over the case, trying to fit the pieces together. That's when an old Navajo man named Hastian approached us. He was known around town as a bit of a hermit, but he seemed to know a lot about the old ways. You two should stop asking questions, he said, eyes serious. Some things are meant to stay buried. We pressed him for more, but he wouldn't say anything else. Just kept repeating that we were in danger if we didn't let it go. But we couldn't, not with those images burned into our minds. A few nights later, Marisol called me in a panic. She'd been out for a walk and noticed she was being followed. She described a figure, tall and thin, moving through the trees always just out of sight. We met up and decided to confront whatever it was together. We drove out to the canyon, flashlights in hand, and started searching. It didn't take long to find him, or it. The figure was impossibly tall, with long limbs and a featureless face. It moved with a fluidity that wasn't human. We tried to communicate, but it didn't respond. Instead, it started moving towards us, slow at first, then faster. We ran. I don't remember much about that night except the terror. We stumbled through the dark, tripping over rocks and roots until we made it back to the car. We drove straight to the police station, but when we explained what happened, they looked at us like we were crazy. No one believed us. That was the beginning of the end. Marisol changed after that night. She became withdrawn, jumpy. She'd wake up screaming, convinced the tall man was in her room. I wasn't much better. I started sleeping with a gun under my pillow, jumping at every shadow. Then, people started disappearing. Hikers, campers, even a couple of locals. The police chalked it up to the rough terrain and bad luck, but we knew better. We could see the patterns, the symbols carved into the rocks near where they vanished. The final straw came when Marisol didn't show up for work one morning. I went to her place and found it empty, her car still in the driveway. There were no signs of struggle, just an eerie silence. I knew then that I had to end this one way or another. I drove out to the canyon alone, armed with nothing but a flashlight and a sense of grim determination. I followed the symbols, moving deeper into the canyon than I'd ever gone before. The air grew colder and the silence was oppressive. I felt like I was being watched. Finally, I reached a clearing. There he was, standing in the center, the tall man. He was even more terrifying up close an impossible figure that defied explanation. I raised my flashlight, the beam trembling, and took a step forward. Why? I shouted. Why are you doing this? He didn't respond, just stared with that blank, featureless face. I felt a chill run through me and knew that this was it. There was no reasoning with him, no bargaining. He was a force of nature, an avenger of wrongs that couldn't be understood. I backed away slowly, 
then turned and ran. I didn't stop until I reached my car, lungs burning, heart pounding. I drove back to town, mind racing. I couldn't keep living in fear, but I also couldn't leave. This was my home, my responsibility. In the end, I decided to tell my story. Maybe it wouldn't stop the tall man, but people needed to know. They needed to respect the land and the old ways, or suffer the consequences. Marisol was never found, and the disappearances continued. The authorities did their best to keep it quiet, but word got out. Hikers started avoiding the canyon, and the locals whispered about the curse. As for me, I stayed on as a ranger, watching, waiting. I never saw the tall man again, but I felt his presence, a constant reminder of the price of disrespect. Some nights when the wind howls through the canyon, I think I hear them, the lost souls calling out in the dark. I sit by the fire and listen, hoping that one day they'll find peace. Until then, I keep my vigil, knowing that some things are meant to stay buried and some spirits are never truly at rest. My name is Arlo Running Deer, and this happened to me back in 1994. I was a 28-year-old guy working as a ranger in the vast, rugged expanse of the Black Hills National Forest. It's a place with towering pines, deep canyons, and secluded trails. I'd been at it for about five years, enjoying the solitude and the beauty of the land my ancestors once roamed freely. The job wasn't just about nature's tranquility. There were plenty of tasks that needed a sharp eye and a firm hand. From managing trails to checking in on campers and sometimes dealing with poachers or vandals, it kept me busy. My partner, a guy named Mason Longtree, and I were the only two rangers assigned to this particular section of the forest. Mason was a good friend, someone I trusted with my life. One afternoon, I was out checking the old logging roads for any signs of illegal activity. I came across an abandoned campsite. It wasn't unusual to find one, but this one had a different vibe. The tent was torn, and belongings were scattered around as if someone left in a hurry. There were no signs of a struggle, no blood or anything like that, but the place was a mess. I radioed Mason and told him about the campsite. He was about an hour away checking another part of the forest. We agreed to meet up and investigate further. As I waited, I sifted through the debris, trying to piece together what might have happened. There were clothes, some food wrappers, a half-burnt log in the fire pit. Nothing out of the ordinary, except for the fact that it looked like whoever had been there left in a hurry. Mason arrived just as the sun was dipping below the horizon. We decided to stay and see if anyone returned. As night fell, the forest around us came alive with the sounds of crickets, owls, and the occasional rustling of leaves. We made a small fire and settled in, keeping our ears open for any unusual noises. It was around midnight when we heard it, a strange, low humming sound. It wasn't like any animal I'd ever heard. Mason and I looked at each other, both thinking the same thing. What the hell was that? We grabbed our flashlights and followed the sound deeper into the woods. It led us to a narrow ravine, and as we peered over the edge, we saw something that made our blood run cold. There, in the moonlight, was a figure. It was humanoid, but not quite. It stood about seven feet tall, with elongated limbs and a pale, almost translucent skin that seemed to glow faintly. It had no eyes that we could see, just dark, empty sockets and its mouth was a gaping hole filled with jagged, uneven teeth. It moved slowly, almost deliberately, as if it was searching for something. Mason whispered, What the hell is that thing? I had no answer. We watched in silence, frozen by a mixture of fear and fascination. The creature sniffed the air, making a soft clicking sound. Then it turned and disappeared into the darkness of the ravine. We hightailed it back to the campsite, our minds racing. We had no idea what we'd just seen, but it was clear that it wasn't something we could handle on our own. We decided to pack up and head back to the ranger station. On our way, we discussed what to do next. 
We couldn't exactly report this to our superiors without sounding like we'd lost our minds. Back at the station, we sat down with a pot of coffee, trying to make sense of what we'd witnessed. We agreed to keep it between us for the time being. We needed more information before we could decide on a course of action. Over the next few days, we patrolled the area where we'd seen the creature, but there was no sign of it. Then, about a week later, things took a darker turn. A hiker named Evelyn Crow, a local who knew the area well, went missing. Her family reported that she'd gone out for a short hike and never returned. Mason and I were assigned to lead the search. We gathered volunteers and set out, scouring the trails and surrounding areas. It was on the second day of the search that we found her, or what was left of her. Her body was lying in the same ravine where we'd seen the creature. She was mutilated, her limbs twisted at unnatural angles, and her face frozen in a mask of terror. There were deep gashes all over her body, as if she'd been attacked by some wild animal. But the wounds didn't match anything that lived in those woods. The sight of her shook us to the core. This wasn't just a missing person anymore. It was a murder investigation. We called it in, and soon the place was swarming with law enforcement. They interviewed everyone, including Mason and me, but we kept our encounter with the creature to ourselves. Who would believe us? Over the next few weeks, two more people went missing. A young couple, Thomas and Rachel Hayes, who had come to the forest for a weekend getaway. Their campsite was found in a similar state to the first one I discovered. Their bodies turned up a few days later, not far from where Evelyn had been found, similarly mutilated. The local authorities were at a loss. They couldn't figure out what kind of animal could have done this. Rumors started spreading among the locals about some sort of monster in the woods. People were scared, and the number of visitors to the forest dwindled to almost nothing. Mason and I couldn't sit idly by. We had to do something, even if it meant putting our own lives at risk. We armed ourselves with rifles and went back to the ravine one night, determined to find the creature and put an end to the terror. We set up a stakeout, hiding among the rocks and trees, waiting for it to show itself. Hours passed, and just when we were starting to think we'd come up empty, we heard the clicking sound again. It was closer this time. We held our breath, gripping our rifles tightly. The creature emerged from the shadows, moving with that same slow, deliberate gait. It stopped, sniffing the air, then turned its head in our direction. I whispered to Mason, On my count, three... Two, one. We both fired. The shots echoed through the ravine, and the creature let out a screech that chilled me to the bone. It stumbled back, clearly wounded but not dead. It charged at us with surprising speed, and we scrambled to reload. Mason managed to get off another shot, hitting it in the chest. The creature fell to the ground, twitching. We approached it cautiously, guns trained on its body. It lay there bleeding a dark, thick fluid that smelled like rot. Its empty eye socket seemed to stare right through us. Mason and I exchanged a look of grim satisfaction. We'd done it. We'd killed the thing that had been terrorizing the forest. But our relief was short-lived. As we stood there, the creature's body began to dissolve into the ground, leaving behind nothing but a dark stain on the earth. We stared in disbelief. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. It was something beyond our understanding. We made our way back to the ranger station in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. We knew we couldn't explain what had happened, not in any way that would make sense to anyone else. We decided to keep it to ourselves, to let the mystery of the Black Hills remain just that. A mystery. The disappearances stopped after that night. The forest seemed to return to its usual quiet self, but Mason and I never forgot what we'd seen. We continued our work, but with a new respect for the unknown forces that might lurk in the wilderness. Years later, when I tell this story to friends over a campfire, they often laugh, thinking it's just a spooky tale to scare the kids. But I know the truth. 
There are things in this world we'll never understand, things that defy logic and reason, and sometimes those things are better left undiscovered. My name is Deacon Redfeather, and this happened to me back in 1989. I was living in a small town in Montana called Cedar Springs, a place so quiet that the biggest event of the year was the county fair. Everyone knew everyone else, and we didn't lock our doors at night. I was 26 then, working as a park ranger at the nearby state park, which covered a vast, forested area. I loved my job. Being surrounded by nature was peaceful and I felt a deep connection to the land. My father was a member of the Crow Nation, and he taught me to respect the wilderness and all the creatures within it. It was late October, the trees had shed most of their leaves, and the air had that crisp chill signaling the arrival of winter. I was doing my usual rounds when I first heard about the missing hiker. A young woman named Linda Connolly, who'd been camping with her friends, had wandered off and hadn't returned. Her friends were worried so they contacted the park office. Missing hikers weren't common, but it wasn't unheard of, and usually they were found within a day or two. I met up with Sheriff Daryl Harding at the park's edge. He was a grizzled old man, tough as nails, who'd been sheriff for as long as anyone could remember. With him were a couple of his deputies and a search and rescue team. We split into groups and began combing through the woods. As the sun started to set, we had to call off the search for the night. I decided to camp out in my ranger cabin, figuring I'd start fresh at dawn. The next morning, we resumed our search. Hours turned into days, and we found no trace of Linda. No footprints, no camping gear, nothing. Her friends were beside themselves with worry, and the town was on edge. On the third day, we expanded the search area. That's when things started to get strange. I was paired with a new guy from the search and rescue team, Ethan Gentry, a quiet but sturdy fellow. We hiked deeper into the woods, an area less traveled. As we moved through the thick underbrush, we stumbled upon an old, dilapidated cabin. It wasn't marked on any of our maps. The place looked like it hadn't been touched in years, maybe decades. The windows were boarded up and the door hung loosely on its hinges. Ever seen this before? Ethan asked peering through a crack in the door. No, I replied. I didn't even know this was here. Let's take a look inside. We pushed the door open and it creaked loudly. The interior was dim, with only slivers of light filtering through the gaps in the boards. Dust and cobwebs covered everything. It looked abandoned, but something felt off. As we stepped inside, the smell hit us, something foul and rotting. We found old furniture, a rusted stove, and scattered debris. But in the back room, we made a grim discovery. In the corner there was a makeshift bed, and on it lay a bundle of old blankets. Ethan moved closer and pulled back the layers, revealing a skeletal hand. We both froze. It was a human body, long dead, reduced to bones and tattered clothing. There was no way to identify who it was, but it didn't look like it had been there for years. More like months. We radioed Sheriff Harding, who arrived with his team. They cordoned off the area and started an investigation. Meanwhile, we continued searching for Linda, now with a new sense of urgency. The discovery of the body added a dark cloud over Cedar Springs. A couple of days later, while out on another search, Ethan and I found more clues. We came across a series of strange, circular clearings in the forest, almost like crop circles, but made by removing all vegetation down to the bare soil. They were perfectly round, about ten feet in diameter. I'd never seen anything like it. It didn't make sense. There were no tracks leading to or from the clearings, just these barren patches. As we stood there, pondering what could have made them, we heard a rustling in the trees. A figure emerged, staggering towards us. It was Linda. She was disheveled, her clothes torn and dirty, and she looked terrified. We rushed to her and she collapsed in our arms, muttering incoherently about the creature. Back at the ranger station, we got Linda some water and tried to calm her down. She kept saying the same thing over and over. It's out there. 
It's coming for us. We couldn't get much more out of her before she passed out from exhaustion. We radioed for medical help and she was taken to the hospital. The next day, Sheriff Harding called a town meeting. He didn't want to cause a panic, but he needed to inform everyone about what was happening. He described Linda's condition and the body we found, urging everyone to stay out of the woods until we could figure out what was going on. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what Linda had said. It's out there. I decided to do some research. I dug through old town records, newspaper archives, and even some of my father's old stories about the land. There were mentions of disappearances dating back decades, always around the same area, but nothing concrete, just whispers and folklore. One name stood out in my father's stories, Wendigo. He described it as a malevolent spirit, a creature that roamed the forests, preying on those who ventured too far into its territory. I didn't believe in legends, but the coincidences were hard to ignore. The following day, I went back to the cabin with Ethan. We wanted to see if we missed anything. As we approached, the forest was eerily silent. No birds, no rustling leaves, just an oppressive stillness. Inside the cabin, we found scratch marks on the walls, deep gouges that hadn't been there before. Something had been inside since we left. We heard a noise outside, a low, guttural sound that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We rushed out, guns drawn, but saw nothing. Just the empty forest. We decided to set up a night watch, taking turns to see if anything came back. That night, while Ethan slept, I kept watch by the dying fire. Around midnight, I heard it again, that same unsettling noise. I scanned the darkness, and then I saw it, something moving between the trees. It was tall, gaunt, with long limbs and glowing eyes. It looked almost human but distorted, unnatural. It moved with a fluid grace that sent a chill down my spine. I nudged Ethan awake and we both watched as the figure circled the clearing, never coming too close, but always in sight. We stayed up all night, but it never attacked. At dawn, it vanished into the woods. We packed up and headed back to town, determined to warn everyone. Sheriff Harding didn't take us seriously at first. He thought we were spooked by the woods and our imaginations were running wild. But then, more reports came in. People heard noises at night, saw strange figures lurking at the edge of their property. The town was on edge. We decided to organize a large search party, armed and ready. About twenty of us, including the sheriff, his deputies, Ethan and myself, ventured deep into the forest. We were determined to find whatever was terrorizing Cedar Springs. We reached the cabin again, and that's when it all went to hell. The creature attacked, swift and brutal. It took down two of the deputies before anyone could react. We fired at it, but it moved so quickly, dodging between the trees. Panic set in, and we scattered. Ethan and I stuck together running through the woods, trying to find a place to make a stand. We ended up in one of those circular clearings, backs against each other, guns ready. The creature emerged, slowly this time, almost as if it was toying with us. It lunged at Ethan, and I fired hitting it in the shoulder. It let out a terrible scream, a sound that didn't seem possible for any living thing. It turned its attention to me, eyes glowing with rage. I fired again, but it kept coming. Just as it was about to reach me, the sheriff and the rest of the group arrived, guns blazing. The creature finally retreated, disappearing into the darkness. We regrouped, shaken, but alive. We decided to track it, following the blood trail. It led us to a cave hidden in a rocky outcrop, deep in the forest. Inside, we found more bodies, some recent, others much older. It was a graveyard. As we ventured deeper, we found the creature, wounded but still dangerous. It attacked again, and this time, we didn't hold back. We unloaded everything we had, bullets, flares, anything to take it down. Finally, it fell, lifeless. We dragged its body back to town showing everyone what had been haunting us. It was a horrifying sight, a twisted nightmarish version of a human. We burned it, 
hoping to rid ourselves of its curse. Linda recovered slowly, and she moved away not long after, unable to bear the memories. The town tried to return to normal, but the scars remained. The woods were never the same, and neither was I. I left my job as a ranger, unable to shake the feeling that something else was still out there. Watching. Waiting. Years later, I still think about that creature. Some say it was just a wild animal. Others believe it was something more. For me, it's a reminder that there are things in this world we may never understand, and some places are better left undisturbed. My name is Harlan Two Trees, and this happened to me back in 1987. I was working as a park ranger in the Bighorn National Forest in Wyoming. It's a vast expanse of wilderness, teeming with wildlife and known for its stunning scenery. I was relatively new to the job, having only been there for a few months, but I loved it. The isolation and tranquility were a welcome change from the noise of the city where I grew up. One crisp morning in early October, I was assigned to check on some remote campsites. We had reports of illegal hunting and suspected poaching activity. The forest was in the thick of hunting season, so we had to be extra vigilant. I packed my gear, grabbed my rifle, standard issue though I rarely had to use it, and headed out. I started my day at the ranger station, filling out some paperwork and grabbing a quick breakfast. There were four of us on duty that day, but we often worked alone. We radioed in our locations periodically, just to keep tabs on each other. My first stop was an area known as Crazy Woman Canyon. The name always amused me, though I never asked why it was called that. By mid-morning, I had reached the canyon. It was quiet, too quiet. No birds, no rustling leaves, just an eerie stillness. I chalked it up to the weather, overcast and chilly, the kind that makes you feel like something's about to happen. I found a few signs of recent activity, a smoldering campfire, discarded beer cans and some food wrappers. Typical signs of careless campers, but nothing out of the ordinary. I was about to radio in when I heard a rustling in the underbrush. I turned, expecting to see a deer or maybe a bear, but what I saw made my blood run cold. It was a man or at least I thought it was a man. He was tall and gaunt, with long, matted hair and eyes that seemed too large for his face. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and he wore tattered clothes that looked like they'd been through hell. Hey you! I called out, trying to sound authoritative. This is a restricted area. You need to leave. He didn't respond. Instead, he just stood there, staring at me with those unnerving eyes. I took a step closer, my hand instinctively moving to my rifle. I said, you need to leave. That's when he moved. It was so fast I barely had time to react. One moment he was standing still, and the next he was right in front of me, his hand on my rifle. I struggled to pull away, but he was incredibly strong. We grappled for a moment, but I managed to push him back and get some distance between us. Get out of here! I shouted, my heart pounding in my chest. He didn't move, just continued to stare at me with that blank expression. I backed away slowly, my rifle trained on him. As soon as I felt I was far enough, I turned and ran back to my truck. I radioed in, breathless, telling the others what had happened. They sent out a team to search the area, but they didn't find anything. No sign of the man, no tracks, nothing. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. They chalked it up to my imagination, said I was probably just spooked by a hiker or a poacher. But I knew what I saw. That man, or whatever he was, was real. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I closed my eyes I saw his face, those haunting eyes staring back at me. The next day, I went back to the canyon with a couple of my colleagues. We searched the area thoroughly but again found nothing. I was starting to doubt myself, wondering if maybe I had imagined the whole thing. A few days later I was out on another patrol when I heard a report over the radio. One of the other rangers, Kevin Harrow, 
had found something disturbing. I rushed to his location, a remote campsite deep in the forest. When I got there, I saw Kevin standing by the edge of the clearing, looking pale and shaken. What is it? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He pointed to a spot on the ground. There, he said. Look. I walked over and saw what had him so rattled. It was a body, or what was left of one. The remains were scattered, as if something or someone had torn it apart. The sight was gruesome, the kind of thing you see in horror movies, not in real life. I felt bile rise in my throat and had to turn away. We need to call this in, Kevin said, his voice trembling. I nodded and reached for my radio. As I did, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A figure standing just at the edge of the trees. It was him. The man from the canyon. He was watching us, his expression as blank and unsettling as before. Kevin, look, I whispered, pointing towards the figure. But when Kevin turned, the man was gone, vanished again, just like before. We called in the authorities, and soon the area was swarming with police and forensic teams. They identified the body as a local hunter who had been reported missing a week earlier. The cause of death was unclear, but the sheer brutality of the scene left little doubt that it was a violent end. The investigation went on for weeks, but they never found any leads. No one had seen or heard anything unusual, and there were no suspects. The case went cold and life in the forest returned to its quiet routine. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still out there, watching. About a month later, I was on patrol again, this time near a place called Shell Falls. It's a beautiful spot, with cascading waterfalls and lush greenery. I was hoping the serene surroundings would help clear my mind. As I walked along the trail, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned expecting to see another ranger, but instead, I saw him again. The man from the canyon, standing just a few feet away. This time, he was closer, and I could see more details. His clothes were even more tattered, his skin more pallid. But it was his eyes that caught my attention. They were dark, almost black, and seemed to bore into my soul. Who are you? I demanded trying to keep my voice steady. He didn't answer, just took a step closer. I raised my rifle, but he didn't flinch. Stay back, I warned, my finger hovering over the trigger. He took another step, and I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the forest. But when the smoke cleared, he was gone. No blood, no body, nothing. It was as if he had never been there. I stood there shaking, my mind racing. Was I going crazy? Had I imagined the whole thing? I radioed in, but I didn't mention the man. I just said I thought I heard something and fired a warning shot. They told me to take a break, said I was probably just stressed, but I knew it was more than that. I was being hunted. Over the next few weeks, I saw him several more times, always at a distance, always watching. I started to feel like I was losing my grip on reality. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw his face, those dark, soulless eyes. Then, one night, it all came to a head. I was at home trying to relax with a beer and some TV, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I got up to check the locks on the doors and windows, and that's when I saw him. Standing in my yard, just beyond the porch light, I grabbed my rifle and ran outside. What do you want? I shouted my voice echoing in the still night. He didn't answer, just stood there, watching. I raised my rifle, but before I could fire, he lunged at me. We grappled, and I felt his cold, clammy hands around my throat. I struggled, trying to break free, but he was too strong. Just when I thought I was done for, I heard a gunshot. The man let go of me and staggered back. I turned to see Kevin, my fellow ranger, standing there with his rifle. He had followed me home, worried about me after everything that had happened. Are you okay? He asked, rushing over to help me up. I nodded, gasping for breath. I think so. Thank you. We looked around, but the man was gone. There was no sign of him, no blood, nothing. Just like before. 
Kevin helped me back inside, and we called the authorities. They searched the area but found nothing. After that night, the sightings stopped. I never saw the man again, and life slowly returned to normal. But I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still out there, watching, waiting. I left the ranger service not long after and moved to a different state, hoping to put the whole thing behind me. Years passed and I tried to forget about that time in the Bighorn National Forest, but every now and then I'd catch a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, a shadow or a figure that looked eerily familiar. I'd turn, expecting to see him, but there was never anything there. To this day, I don't know who or what that man was. Some kind of spirit, a ghost, or maybe just a very disturbed individual. I may never know, but one thing's for sure. I won't be going back to those woods anytime soon. My name is Nathan Redhawk, and this story happened to me back in 1994. I was living in a small town in northern Minnesota, a place where everyone knew each other and the forest was never far away. I grew up there, with the woods being my playground. Hunting, fishing, and hiking were second nature to me. Life was simple, but it had its share of excitement. That summer, my buddy Ray and I decided to go on a camping trip. Ray Baptiste was one of those friends you have your whole life. We'd been through thick and thin together since kindergarten. Ray was a bit of a jokester, always looking for a laugh, but he was solid when things got serious. We planned to head out to an old camping spot near the edge of the Boundary Waters, a place we hadn't visited since high school. It was remote, perfect for some peace and quiet. We packed light, a couple of tents, some fishing gear, a cooler full of beer, and enough food to last us the weekend. Neither of us thought to bring a gun. I mean, we were in Minnesota. The biggest threat out there was probably a raccoon raiding your food stash. We left on a Friday morning, aiming to get there by noon. The drive was uneventful, just miles of trees and the occasional deer darting across the road. We reached the trailhead around noon, parked the truck, and started the hike in. It was about three miles to the campsite, a spot we called the hollow, because it sat in a natural dip surrounded by trees. It was perfect for camping, secluded and quiet. We got to the hollow, set up our tents, and gathered some wood for a fire. The afternoon was spent fishing at a nearby stream. We caught a few trout, enough for dinner. By the time the sun started setting, we were back at camp, cooking our catch over the fire and sipping on cold beers. Ray started telling stories, as he always did. He talked about the time we snuck into the old Johnson barn and found that stash of old comic books, or the time we got lost in the woods for a whole day when we were kids. We laughed, reminisced, and enjoyed the crackling fire. The sky was clear, and the stars were out in full force. It was around midnight when things started to get strange. We heard a noise, something like a branch snapping. Ray looked at me and I shrugged. Probably just an animal, I thought. But then we heard it again, closer this time. Ray stood up, grabbing a flashlight. You hear that, Nate? Yeah, probably just a deer or something. Ray shone the light around the edge of the campsite. Nothing but trees and darkness. He turned off the flashlight, and we went back to our conversation. But we were both a little on edge. It was too quiet. The kind of quiet that makes you feel like you're being watched. We decided to call it a night and climbed into our tents. I fell asleep quickly but woke up to a rustling noise outside. It was soft at first, like someone moving stealthily. I lay still, listening. The rustling grew louder, and then I heard Ray's voice, low and tense. Nate, you awake? Yeah, you hear that? Yeah. What do you think it is? No idea. Let's check it out. We unzipped our tents and stepped out into the cool night air. Ray had his flashlight again, and I grabbed a stick from the firewood pile, feeling a bit silly but wanting something in my hand. We stood there listening. The rustling had stopped, but the silence was even more unsettling. Maybe it's nothing, 
Ray said, but his voice didn't sound convinced. Just as we were about to go back to our tents, we heard a low, almost guttural sound. It wasn't an animal noise, at least not one I recognized. It sent a chill down my spine, and I could see Ray's face pale in the light of the flashlight. Let's get the hell out of here, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We packed up our tents as quickly as we could, our movements frantic and clumsy. The noise started again, louder and closer. It was a shuffling sound, like something dragging itself through the underbrush. We didn't stick around to find out what it was. We grabbed our packs and started down the trail, moving as fast as we could in the dark. As we walked, I kept looking back, expecting to see something following us. The forest was eerily silent, except for our hurried footsteps. We were about a mile from the campsite when Ray stopped abruptly. Did you hear that? I hadn't, but I trusted Ray's instincts. He shone the flashlight around, and that's when we saw it. Eyes. Glowing eyes staring at us from the darkness. They were too high off the ground to be a normal animal, and the shape behind them was all wrong. It was tall, thin, almost skeletal, with long limbs that moved in an unnatural way. Run! Ray shouted, and we bolted. We ran through the forest, branches whipping at our faces, the beam of the flashlight bouncing wildly. I could hear Ray breathing heavily beside me, and my own heart pounded in my chest. I didn't dare look back. We just kept running, driven by pure fear. When we finally reached the truck, we threw our gear in the back and jumped in. Ray fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking. The engine roared to life, and we tore out of there, gravel flying. We didn't stop until we were miles away, back in the safety of the town lights. We didn't talk much on the drive back, both of us too shaken to make sense of what we'd seen. Ray dropped me off at my place, and we promised to meet up the next day to talk things over. That night, I didn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those glowing eyes in that twisted shape. The next morning, I called Ray. No answer. I figured he was just as shaken as I was and needed some time. But when I still hadn't heard from him by noon, I started to worry. I drove over to his place, but his truck wasn't there. I asked around, but no one had seen him since the night before. I went to the police, but they didn't take me seriously. Just another camper spooked by the woods, they said. But I knew something was wrong. Ray wouldn't just disappear like that. I decided to go back to the hollow, see if I could find any clues. I arrived at the trailhead, my heart pounding. The place looked the same as it always had, but it felt different. I hiked back to the campsite, every snap of a twig making me jump. When I got there, everything was just as we'd left it. Our fire pit, the spot where our tents had been, the stream where we'd fished. But there was no sign of Ray. I spent hours searching, calling out his name, but there was nothing. As the sun started to set, I knew I had to leave. The thought of being out there in the dark again was too much. I headed back to the truck, my mind racing with possibilities. Where could he have gone? What had we seen that night? Back in town, I tried to get the police to search the area, but they were reluctant. They organized a small search party, but after a couple of days with no leads, they called it off. Ray was officially a missing person, and I was left with more questions than answers. Weeks turned into months, and there was still no sign of Ray. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, something that had taken him. I did some research trying to find out if anyone else had seen anything similar. I came across stories of a creature, a humanoid figure that lurked in the forests of the north. They called it the Tall One, an old legend among the native tribes. But it was just a story, right? I tried to move on with my life, but the memories of that night haunted me. Every time I went into the woods, I felt like I was being watched. I stopped camping, stopped hiking, stopped doing the things I loved. The forest that had once been my refuge now felt like a place of danger. A year later, a hiker found Ray's truck abandoned in a remote part of the woods, miles from where we had been. 
There were no signs of a struggle, no clues as to what had happened. The police reopened the case, but it went cold again quickly. Ray was gone, and no one could explain why. I still think about him, about what we saw that night. I don't know what the Tall One is or if it even exists outside of my nightmares, but I do know that something out there is capable of making people disappear without a trace. I stay away from the woods now, keeping my distance from the place that once felt like home. Sometimes, late at night, I sit on my porch and stare into the darkness, wondering if those eyes are out there, watching me. The world is full of mysteries, and some of them are better left unsolved. Ray's disappearance taught me that much. Life goes on, but the shadows remain, and the memory of that night will always be with me. My name is Will Lone Bear, and this happened to me back in 1996. I'm from a small town in Montana, a place where everybody knows everybody else. Life there was quiet, which suited me fine. I worked as a mechanic fixing up trucks and tractors for folks around town. Nothing much happened in our neck of the woods. Until that summer, anyway. It started like any other day. I was finishing up an old Chevy pickup in my garage when my buddy, Jake Eagle, swung by. Jake and I go way back, all the way to grade school. He had that wild look in his eyes, the one that usually meant trouble. Hey Will, Jake said, grinning. You up for some adventure tonight? What kind of adventure? I asked, wiping grease off my hands. You heard about the old Anderson place, right? Folks say it's haunted. Thought we might check it out, you know, for kicks. I rolled my eyes. Haunted, huh? I'm not much for ghost stories. Jake laughed. Come on, it'll be fun. Bring a flashlight and maybe something to drink. Let's make a night of it. I shrugged. All right, what the hell? Beat sitting around here. The Anderson place was a dilapidated old farmhouse on the edge of town, long abandoned. People said it was cursed, that strange things happened there but I figured it was just a bunch of tall tales. We met up later that evening, just as the sun dipped below the horizon. Jake brought his girlfriend, Marnie Swift, and her brother, Josh. We piled into Jake's truck and headed out. The farmhouse looked even creepier at dusk, with its sagging roof and boarded-up windows. We parked a little ways off and hiked the rest of the way, flashlights cutting through the gathering darkness. Inside, the place was a mess, Broken furniture, shattered glass, graffiti on the walls. It stank of mildew and old wood. Jake, always the daredevil, led the way upstairs while Marnie and Josh stayed close behind. This place gives me the creeps, Marnie whispered. You scared of ghosts? Jake teased. Just bad vibes, that's all, she replied, clutching Josh's arm. We poked around for a bit, not finding much just the usual signs of decay and neglect. Then we heard it, a thump, like something heavy falling. We froze, flashlights darting toward the sound. What the hell was that? Josh whispered. Probably just the wind, I said, though I didn't believe it myself. Jake, ever the brave one, crept forward. Let's check it out. We followed him to a door at the end of the hall. It was ajar, creaking slightly as we pushed it open. Inside was an old bedroom, furniture draped in sheets, dust everywhere. And there, in the corner, something moved. Did you see that? Marnie gasped. Yeah, probably a raccoon, Jake said, stepping closer. But it wasn't a raccoon. The thing that stepped out of the shadows was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was tall, hunched over, with long limbs and pale, almost translucent skin. Its eyes glowed faintly in the dark. What the hell is that? Josh shouted. Run! Jake yelled, but it was too late. The creature lunged at him, moving with unnatural speed. Jake tried to dodge, but it swiped at him with razor-sharp claws, leaving deep gashes in his arm. He screamed, and we all bolted for the door. We tumbled down the stairs, hearts pounding, fear driving us forward. Marnie was crying, Josh was swearing, and Jake was bleeding badly. 
I glanced back once, seeing the creature standing at the top of the stairs, watching us with those eerie eyes. We made it to the truck and peeled out of there, tires spinning on the dirt road. Nobody spoke on the drive back to town. We were all too shaken, too scared. Jake's arm was a mess, and we had to get him to the hospital. At the hospital, the doctors patched Jake up, but he needed stitches, and a lot of them. He told them he'd been attacked by a wild animal, which wasn't far from the truth. But none of us mentioned the creature. Who would believe us? Over the next few days, things got worse. Jake developed a fever, his wounds not healing right. He started having nightmares, talking about the creature in his sleep. Marnie was a wreck, and Josh didn't want to talk about it at all. One night, I went to check on Jake. He looked terrible, pale and sweating, eyes sunken. He grabbed my arm, his grip surprisingly strong. Will, it's coming for us, he said, voice weak. That thing, it's not done with us. Jake, you're just sick. You need rest, I tried to reassure him. No, you don't understand, he insisted. It's real. It's coming. I stayed with him that night, but I couldn't shake the feeling he was right. Something was out there, something not natural, and it was after us. The next morning, Jake was gone. His bed was empty, the window open. We searched everywhere, but he was nowhere to be found. Marnie was beside herself with worry, and Josh looked like he might lose it. We called the sheriff and a search was organized. They combed the woods, but no sign of Jake. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. As days turned into weeks, hope faded. Marnie moved in with relatives, unable to bear staying in town. Josh quit his job and started drinking heavily. And I... I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. One evening I decided to go back to the Anderson place. Maybe I was looking for answers, or maybe I just wanted to face my fear. I armed myself with a hunting knife and a flashlight, just in case. The farmhouse looked even worse in the moonlight, like a place out of a nightmare. I forced myself to go in, every step a struggle against the terror gnawing at me. The house was silent, except for the creak of old wood under my feet. I made my way back to that room, the one where we'd first seen the creature. The air was cold, and the hairs on my neck stood up. My flashlight flickered and I cursed, smacking it to stay on. And then I saw it, standing in the corner. The creature watching me with those same glowing eyes. It hadn't aged a day, looked exactly as I remembered. My heart raced, but I held my ground. What do you want? I demanded, knife in hand. It didn't respond, just stared. I felt a chill run through me, not from fear but something deeper, a sense of doom. Then it moved, faster than I could react. It was on me in an instant, clawed hands grabbing my arm. I slashed at it with the knife, but it was like cutting through smoke. It didn't even flinch. The last thing I remember is hitting the floor, my head cracking against the wood. Darkness took over, and I knew no more. I woke up in the hospital, bandaged and sore. The sheriff was there, looking grim. Will, we found you at the Anderson place. What the hell were you doing out there? I told him everything about the creature, the attack on Jake, his disappearance. He listened, but I could tell he didn't believe me. Sounds like you had a bad fall hit your head pretty hard. Maybe you were seeing things, he said. I wasn't seeing things, I insisted. That creature is real. It took Jake. He shook his head. We found no sign of Jake, no sign of anything, really. The place is falling apart. You shouldn't have gone out there. I knew arguing was pointless. People wouldn't believe what they didn't see. But I knew the truth. The creature was real, and it was still out there. Months passed, and life went on, sort of. Jake was officially listed as missing, presumed dead. Marnie never came back, and Josh moved away. The town moved on, but I couldn't. Not really. I kept my knife close and my eyes open. Every creak of the floor, every rustle in the night, set my nerves on edge. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, that the creature was still out there, waiting. One night, I heard something outside my window. A soft, scraping sound like claws on glass. 
My heart raced and I grabbed my knife, creeping to the window. There was nothing there, just the wind in the trees. But I knew better. It was out there somewhere, watching, waiting. And I knew, deep down, it would come back. Maybe not tonight, maybe not tomorrow, but someday. And when it did, I'd be ready, because this wasn't over, not by a long shot. 